you haven't, uh, uh, or I would ask you right now to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be reading beginning in verse um, 34. Eventually we will end up over at um, uh, Romans chapter 14. And I realize that on Friday the governor's announced that we're going to be going green. And uh, as you can see, my hair's still growing. And uh, hopefully after this next week, I'll be able to get a haircut. So you'll, I'll still be the fuzzy wuzzy pastor next Sunday, and uh, unless my hair falls out, which I hope that certainly doesn't happen. But you know, I'm kind of getting used to this. I don't know, maybe. I've been thinking about getting those oversized sunglasses with the bright gold frames and blue uh, lenses and maybe some gold chains, and I don't know. Well, probably not. But anyways... Uh, we're all hanging in there. We've all had to make adjustments. I've used so much hairspray, I've probably damaged the ozone layer myself. But uh, hopefully that's going to change here pretty soon. And we can all begin to uh, get back to some, some phase of normal, though uh, things will be changing. And I'm going to talk about that this morning um, as we look into the Word of God. So we're in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Father, we come today, we ask you would bless us as we look into your word. Lord, we pray for our nation, so much strife, so much division. Lord, we know that only you can bring the kind of peace and the kind of healing. And so, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with our congregation as we begin to open up next week. And uh, Lord, with all that's going to be happening, with all the challenges before us, uh, that your spirit would just truly Uh, descend on this place and bring us together in a sense of unity and purpose and that we would come together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're coming here to worship you and to lift up your name and to honor you and so we want to thank you and praise you for that opportunity we lift up these names that we've mentioned and many others in our congregation that are hurting we think of our shut-ins we think of our missionaries we think of those serving in the military and Lord we just are so thankful for the opportunity Uh, to take the gospel and to bring it to wherever folks are listening to this, whether today or at a future date. And we ask you would bless your word as you always do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We recognize there are differing opinions concerning the COVID-19 crisis and and our response to it. We know that not everyone is going to agree uh, with any or maybe all of our decisions and procedures. But we as leadership have counseled together, we've prayed together, we've looked at uh, different aspects, and uh, we're making decisions with uh, your, you in mind, and we're making our decisions with the safety of our congregation in mind. And so knowing that there are some very, you know, varied opinions, I thought maybe today, uh, in preparation for next Sunday, we would look at some passages of Scripture, and I want to consider some key key passages when we think about what our responsibilities are to one another as the body of Christ. This particular passage is during the last week of Jesus' ministry. The Jewish leaders hate him. They're trying to entrap him, and they've been sending different groups to him to try to catch him in his words. And then this lawyer comes and asks him this question. And though I think as you study this passage here and in the Gospel of Mark, I think this man is at least open-minded to a point, but he was sent by his cohorts to try to trap Jesus in his words. And he comes with this question, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And the Jews had a number of commandments they had added to the Old Testament. Probably he's thinking about the Ten Commandments, I would suspect, and Jesus' answer is very insightful. Jesus revealed that the most comprehensive duty of any person is to love the one true God with all of one's heart. If you want to sum up the whole duty of man, it is to love the one true God with all of our heart. That's emphasized verses 37 and 38. You shall love the Lord your God with 
all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the extent of that commandment is seen in the repetition of the word all. You know, the heart represents the core of our identity. The heart represents the true self, the true me, the true you. When you talk about the soul, we're talking about the emotions. The mind here is my will. And then he talks about our strength, my physical energy. The whole point is with my whole being, I am to worship God, I am to love God, and I am to serve him and acknowledge him. This is the greatest commandment of all. And it is devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that Jesus Christ is God of very God. One day, I look forward to the day when I will see my Savior, and I, I, I wonder if I will say like Thomas did when he saw the risen Lord, my Lord and my God. To see Jesus is to see God, and so this is devotion to the Lord Jesus. And then I want to look at the second great commandment here today. An individual's second priority is to love others as they love themselves. They asked the lawyer, said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God. Then Jesus added, the second is like unto it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Even if you look at the Ten Commandments, some of them are about devotion to God. Others are about our, our love for others, our neighbor. And so the whole commandment structure, you could say, is bound up in these two commandments. It's built into our DNA. Can you imagine the difference as we look at the unrest in our culture today? Some people look at a commandment like this, love your neighbors yourself, and they say, oh, that's kindergarten. That's children's stuff. That's child's play. But can you imagine the difference that would make in our culture if people actually lived by that commandment? What do we see in our culture? We see selfishness and, and greed and people using other people and, and, and murder and abuse and hatred and, and violence and division. And Jesus said, this is the second great commandment. Now, some people teach this and they believe that the reason people can't love others is because they can't love themselves. You've probably heard that in pop psychology, or you've probably seen some, some show on TV, and some supposed expert is talking about some dysfunctional family, and then they're talking about low self-esteem, and the problem is people don't love themselves. I remember years ago, there was this popular song, and, and the phrase went, the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. We have to teach this to our children. <laughs> uh, I know. Now, do I understand that some people and some children have been abused or people have been misused and it has damaged them psychologically and emotionally and spiritually? I, I'm not discounting that. But the notion that we have to teach children to love themselves, uh, you know, self-love has never been lacking in human nature. I've had a great weekend because uh, our, our daughter and her family uh, called and surprised us. They were coming up, and they came up Friday, our daughter Marcy and Ben and the three boys. And they came up because our son DJ down in Cumberland, Maryland, has uh, gotten his church, and they, they bought a house. He and Gigi bought a house. And so uh, we, they all came up, and we went down yesterday to help them uh, move into their house, and the men and people from their church came over, and it was just a really good time. Uh, because of my back issues, uh, I can't really lift. So I was on Elijah duty. Elijah is uh, DJ and Gigi's three-and-a-half-year-old uh, little boy. And um, how do you think that afternoon went? I was up in the room guarding Elijah. I did a pretty good job. He only got away from me once, and I chased him down the stairs. But I caught him. And, and so the rest of the time, we're up in there. And he was actually pr pretty good with that. But how do you think that afternoon went? Do you think that Elijah was so concerned with Pappy's needs the whole time? Do you think Elijah was constantly worried about, you know, was I okay? Was I doing all right? You say, wait a minute, he's three and a half years old. Well, any of you that have children or have been around children or have been a child, <laughs> which is everybody, knows how self-absorbed children are. Sadly, we adults are often very self-absorbed. And so the idea is that people don't have to be taught self-love. Uh, John calls it the pride of life. And though little Elijah was really good, and then we got to go over to see DJ's church, and 
except he ran away and he turned the fire alarm on and DJ couldn't figure out how to turn it off. But other than that, things went really, really well. My point is, this is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying you have to learn to love yourself and then you can love other people. Self-love has never been a problem for human nature. He's referring to our built-in desire to care for ourselves. It is only natural to protect yourself. It's only natural to want to meet your own needs. If you're thirsty, you want to drink. If you're hungry, you want to eat. And that's what he's using here as an illustration. We strive for our own happiness. And what he's saying is, as you strive for your own happiness, we should be, the, the second great commandment is, we should be loving others in the way that we love ourselves. Now, Paul, when he talks about marriage, kind of helps us to understand this. In Ephesians 5, 28, Paul says, Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. The same principle. Love your neighbor, love one another as you love yourself, because we all, quite frankly, love ourselves. Now, the word Jesus uses is the highest form of love the highest form of love. Different words for love in the Greek New Testament. The word we're looking at here is the word agape. Some say agapa, however you want to say it, but it's agape love. This is divine love. When the Bible says God is love, it is this love. And so how do we love with the kind of love that God loves us? Well, in Galatians 5.22, we find out it's the fruit or a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you and I trust Christ as Savior, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. As we give control, as we yield to the Holy Spirit in our lives, He produces certain spiritual fruit, and the first fruit is love, and it's agape love. It is the love characterized by God's love. It is a self-sacrificial love. This love in no way is related to the lovability of the person that you're loving. It's not a love that, you know, because of their attractiveness or their kindness or uh, you, you hit it off with them and you connect with them, and it's not from what you get from them that causes you to love them. This is a love that originates in the heart of the yielded believer, and it is generated by the Holy Spirit. You cannot self generate this love. Only a born again believer can love with agape love. This is how God loves us. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Primarily, this is a love of action, not emotion. This love redefines the boundaries of love. Say, what do you mean by that? Jesus used this word agape when he said in Matthew 5, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. This is not a love that is natural to us. Our love is a self-love or, or a selfish love. Uh, we love people because they love us or because we find them attractive or desirable. That's not this kind of love. This is a love that's generated from the lover. There was nothing in us that would cause God to love us to the point where he would send his own perfect son to die on the cross, take the penalty that you and I deserve, and he poured out his judgment on his own perfect son on Calvary's cross. Why would God do that? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So church... You and I, and I'm talking now to our congregation, but really to every Christian, this love is a key evidence of true discipleship, of true discipleship. Pastor Brian alluded to this earlier, John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That was not a new commandment to love others. That was seen in the Old Testament. But Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, and he's in the upper room right before he goes to Gethsemane, and he's talking to his disciples, and here's the new aspect of the commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you may also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But it is a qualified love. It is a certain kind of love. It is the love of Christ. We love others as Christ loved us. And how does he love us? Self-sacrificially, selflessly. It's a giving love. He doesn't love us because we are so lovable. You can only love this way through the gospel. 
Only when you understand the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, only when you understand that he died on the cross for our sin, not his own sin, only then can we have this kind of love. And again, it's generated in my heart by the Holy Spirit. So what exactly is Jesus saying? He's saying that my love for you, my disciples, is to be the measure of your love for one another. So as you and I come to church next Sunday, whatever service we come to, the measure of my love, and it's a love of action, not primarily emotion. It's how I'm going to treat one another. We're going to talk about specifics in a moment. But the measure of my love for you and of your love for me is not the measure of how we love each other. It's the measure of how Christ loves us, his disciples. That's always the challenge. You talk about a high goal. And again, it's not something we can strive for in on ourselves, but we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who is producing this kind of love. Now, when Jesus says that in John 13, that's not a contradiction of what we just read in Matthew 22, the second greatest commandment. That's a clarification. The clarification of that second great commandment, agape, love your neighbor as you love yourself, is the measure of love, is the love Jesus has for us. Now, the practical application of this love is expanded in the epistles. As we go to the epistles, And as we see, particularly Paul, but even Peter, as he talks about how the church is to function as a body, this loving your neighbor, this loving as Jesus loved us, is really at the forefront of all our interactions with one another. So I would ask you to take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13, we see Paul alluding to this passage in chapter 22. In Romans chapter 13, and we pick it up in verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Fulfilled the law. Now, this passage is not prohibiting borrowing. You can borrow mine to buy a home or a car or whatever. Some people take this passage out of context. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's picking up on what Jesus said on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. But Paul reveals something. Paul says, we owe a debt of love to others, especially to those in the body of Christ. Owe no one anything except to love one another. So how are we indebted to others? I mean, that seems to contradict the very nature of agape love. If we said agape love is not based on what other people have done for us, it's based on us loving them out of the resource of the Holy Spirit and yielding to Him and being filled with the Holy Spirit. This love is produced by the Holy Spirit. So how are we indebted? Well, Paul gives us a clue back in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Paul says there, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise, such as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So follow with me here. When Paul says I'm a debtor, it's a form of the same word that he uses in Romans 13, 8, O. So it's basically a form of the same word. So like Paul, we are obligated to show love to others, not because of what we've received from them. It's because of what we've received from Jesus. So logically, it really falls in line with what Jesus says. I want you to love one another as I've loved you. I have loved you. He doesn't say I want you to love one another because each disciple is loving the other. He says you love one another with my love because I've loved you. And he says here, The debt that we owe, that we are obligated to show, is not because of what we've received from other people. It's because of what we've received from Jesus. Romans 1, 5, he says, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name's sake. Now, we are not like Paul. We're not apostles, but every Christian has received grace. I like what John Piper says, the debt of love that we have to unbelievers and believers is not because they have done anything for us. The debt is because Christ has done everything for us. 
It's not because you or my fellow church member has done anything for me that I owe you a debt of love. It's because Christ has done everything for all of us that we owe this debt of love. Because of Christ's love for us, we are to love others. So, we as believers owe it to Jesus, owe it to Jesus to selflessly love others, especially other Christians. So, let's go back to our text and see how Paul ties this together. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. He who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Same thing Jesus said back in Matthew 22. So, I want our congregation to keep this in mind as we come to church next Sunday. And it's, it's especially important because our first service back, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, there are certain admonitions that are given to us in Scripture about our concern for each other. And so we need to particularly keep this in mind. You know, Paul doesn't say here we should be trying to keep the law. We're under the law of Christ now, which basically is the law of love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done with love. Jesus Christ is now to be glorified as our love enabler through faith in Christ alone as we yield to the inward fruit and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's Romans 13, and then Paul naturally moves into Romans 14. Remember, the chapter divisions are not inspired. They're put there later on for, to help us, but the th same thought is now moving through into chapter 14. And Paul follows this up with a section on dealing with differences among Christians. That's what Romans 14 is about. The Holy Spirit put this chapter in the Bible to help us with a number of issues where the Bible does not say yes or no. It's not black and white according to Scripture. These are non-biblical things. When I say non-biblical, I'm not talking about sin these are things that are not specifically mentioned in the Bible. There's no chapter in the Bible that I can turn to uh, to say, okay, when you come out of a pandemic, this is how you're supposed to operate in the church. But there are principles in here. Now, Pastor Brian mentioned this. This COVID-19 and now our response to it, it does have the potential to bring division into the congregation. The survey was extremely helpful. But what the survey showed was, sound like I'm on a game show, the survey showed that on one side you have people who feel that, you know, I'm not coming back yet until there's a, there is a, a, a medicine for this, you know, I'm not coming back until we get that. On the other hand, you have people who say we should have never shut down in the first place, we just used to come back and do everything as normal, but the bulk of our congregation is in the middle and we as leadership feel that we're going to take steps that we feel are practical. Uh, we think they're prudent and, and we can take some time and see what happens. So if we do these inconveniences and nothing happens, but if we don't do anything and something happens. So we feel the wise decision is to move into this in phases, see how it goes and trust the Lord, and we believe he will lead us step by step. Now, the issue in Romans 14 was eating meat offered to idols. We don't have that issue today. People would take meat, and they would offer it in the pagan temples, and then some of that meat was sold in the marketplace, and some Christians had a lot of scruples about, uh, should you buy this? Uh, you know, some would say, well, the, the demon, the, 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 the idols are nothing, but then Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 talks about behind the idol is a demon, and so there was all this confusion in the first century. We don't have that problem particularly today. Now, the old joke that's been around for a long time is my wife worships me because every time at dinner she offers me a burnt offering. Well, uh, the husband that saith that, well, shalt go hungry. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about here. We don't have that problem today. And I think the Holy Spirit absolutely knew that, and he put this chapter in here so we could draw the principles out. And, and it's, it's related to us coming together next Sunday. Very much so. So a couple things I've drawn out of this chapter. 
And just follow along. There's just a few. Number one, do not judge one another. Look at verse 4. We're in Romans 14 and verse 4. Who are you to judge another's servant? Some of you are going to come next Sunday and you are going to choose to wear a mask. Some of you are going to come and you're not going to wear a mask. Some of you may even choose to come and wear gloves. Some of you will not. Some of you are going to do your best to have social distancing. And we're asking all of you to do that, even those of you who feel that it isn't necessary. So again, it's the, it's the principle here. Don't be judging one another. We are not requiring everybody to wear a mask. We're not prohibiting anyone from wearing a mask. And we feel that's the prudent approach. So you need to understand that when you come next Sunday. Secondly, accept the fact that believers will have differing convictions. Accept that fact. Not everybody's going to think like me. Not everybody's going to think like you. There's going to be a lot of different opinions. We know that. We've seen that in the survey. We understand that. The Bible says in verse 5, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Don't confuse unanimity for unity. Unanimity means everybody agrees with everything all the time. That's not the basis of unity. You can have unity where people disagree, but you come together in unity. And so God is the one who's entrusted us as leaders with the care of the congregation. And we're asking you to respect those decisions. Do we have everything right? No, we don't. We're flawed. We're limited. This is a fluid situation. We're, 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 we're going to watch and monitor and make changes and make decisions as we move ahead. But we're doing it with the best of intentions and with your care in mind. Do you realize Christians can disagree on an issue and both be right? Now, we're not talking about issues that are clearly stated in Scripture. But Paul shows it in the first century. There were Christians who would not eat meat offered to an idol. There were other Christians who had no problem. You know what? Both of them were right in their own convictions. That's what Paul teaches us very clearly. And so we're going to have some of you who say we shouldn't be doing anything. You're going to have some in the middle who say, well, I I appreciate some of the mitigations. And you're going to have some over here who say, I'm going to wait to come because I'm just not comfortable yet. All three of you are right. It's your own conviction. But we as leadership responsible for the congregation have to make not just individual decisions, but but decisions which we believe are best and prudent for our congregation. Now notice this one, verse 10. Remember that each of us will give an account to the Lord for how we treat one another. We're going to give an account. Verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christian liberty must always be limited by love. Love one another as I have loved you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what I'm challenging all of us to do to come in here next Sunday. If you come in with the attitude, nobody's going to tell me where to sit. I'm going to shake hands with who I want to. Is that the attitude of Christ? On the other hand, if you can, are you going to make a six-foot stick and bring it to church, and as soon as somebody gets in that, is that the attitude of Christ? Now, I know that's kind of extreme, but we should be coming not thinking of ourselves, but thinking of others. Which leads us to verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Determine not to become a stumbling block for a fellow believer. Respect others. Love them as you love yourself. Come with that attitude of selfless love. And don't casually dismiss the real concerns of others. You may not have those concerns, but the attitude of love is don't don't dismiss them and don't dismiss their concerns. That's not showing love. And what we feel we've developed is a very pragmatic, practical, reasonable approach to church next Sunday. And as Pastor Brian said, it's not going to be the same. Hopefully, before too long, we'll get back to that. 
We're, we've taken chairs and there's no seating in the foyer. We're asking you to come in. We're not going to open the church till a half hour before the service. We're going to ask you to come in, find your seat, social distance. When the service is over, please get up and go. We're not going to hustle you out, but we're asking you if you're going to fellowship, fellowship outside. It's been proven it's safer. You can fellowship how you want outside. We don't think these are putting a great burden on anyone. And we're showing concern for one another. A couple more and we're done. Focus on the major things, not the minor things. Focus on the major things, not the minor things. Verse 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. The kingdom of God is not, I'm not going to social distance. What matters next Sunday is I'm coming to worship Christ. I'm going to observe the Lord's Supper, which I haven't been able to do for months. Is that going to be my focus? Or am I going to be so concerned about what others are doing or not doing that it's going to diminish my opportunity to worship before the Lord? And then be willing to set aside personal preferences for the benefit of the entire body of Christ. That's really the issue, isn't it? I have to do that. We all need to do that. Be willing to set aside personal preferences for the benefit of the entire body of Christ. And we should be doing this every Sunday, not just in this very strange time we find ourselves living in. Verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Is that my pursuit? Or am I so self-focused? Am I so concerned with my viewpoint? See, that's antithetical to what we're just reading. We all need to come to church next week with an attitude of loving submission to one another. I need to come with that attitude. We all need to come with that attitude. 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And remember, we need to prepare our hearts to come to partake of the Lord's table. And in 1 Corinthians 11, those passages I always read when we take the Lord's table, they, they concern the attitude of our heart. They concern about don't you know, judge ourselves so we would not be judged. They're concerned. And the issue at, at Corinth was there was interpersonal issues and problems, intercongregational issues, and they were very serious. A remembrance of Jesus submitting to his Father's will by going to the cross should motivate us to submit to one another as we gather for worship. One last verse, chapter 15, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, verse 3, even Christ did not please himself. Now, if that doesn't prepare me for the Lord's Supper, if that doesn't prepare me to come next Sunday, whatever practical things we put in place to submit to those, to submit to one another, to not judge one another, to pray for one another, not to casually dismiss another person's concern. I, I don't know what else to say to you. I mean, Jesus is our model. He's our example. We are to love others as he loves us. We owe a debt of love to one another, not because what we've done for each other, but because Christ has done everything for us. I know our congregation and though I felt a need to preach this, I honestly believe the heart, the core of our people understand this. And I think you will come next Sunday with a real heart of submission and love for each other. I really believe that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open up again. These have been very strange and, and trying times. Uh, but Lord, we know it's for a purpose. We know, Lord, you've been um, teaching us Lord, you've been pruning us as individual believers. You've been pruning us as a congregation. Lord, we're excited to see what the fruit will be from all of this. And we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to be able to continue to preach the gospel during this time. But we're just so excited to open up next Sunday. We ask, Lord, most of all for your protection. Lord, we know the virus is still here. 
Uh, we know, Lord, it's not going to magically disappear. And we pray, Lord, just your, your hand of protection would be, be on us as we take the necessary precautions and you would intervene and, and just not permit anyone to become infected and that we could come together and, and we could worship together freely. And Lord, those who need to stay home, we certainly understand. May you comfort them. May you give them insight as to when it's time that they could come. And we're just going to trust you for the future. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.